good morning. Um, welcome to the second last day of the um, SOS um, workshop associated with the 2021 ASP Summer Colloquium. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Falco Jutt as the first uh, speaker. Um, Falco's interests reach from predictability and dynamics of high impact weather to uh, tropical meteorology, tropical cyclones, NWP and uh, ASC interactions. Um, he is currently involved in the field campaign um, uh, uh, investigating hurricanes. And he's done some really interesting work um, in predictability uh, using high resolution models, um, in this particular case, MPAS. Um, and uh, uh, I'm excited to see what he will be presenting today. Welcome, Falco. Uh, thank you, Hubert. Um, yeah, and thanks for the team uh, for uh, inviting me to give a talk here. Um, I hope you can uh, see my screen now. Um, looks like you can. Yeah. So, um, um, so I'm I'm actually not a S to S guy. I'm more of a weather person. So I'm going to talk about predictability today. Uh, maybe a little bit more uh, uh, geared towards weather, but uh, we'll see later in the tropics that weather and S2S cannot really be separated. There's a, there's a continuum. Yeah, so um, I'll talk about predictability today, but um, maybe this um, first and foremost, I also want to showcase what we can do with the next generation of global models, uh, which are high resolution convection permitting global models, what we can really do and how they can, uh, how these models can uh, improve um, weather and uh, climate, uh, weather forecasting and climate projections. Uh, and to, to basically to whet your appetite about these models, uh, I want to show this animation. Um, this is actually a 2.5 kilometer global model. And when you look at it, uh, you will probably say, well, that looks like a satellite. Uh, image, right, or a satellite loop. We have a hurricane spinning here in the Atlantic. Uh, we have fairly reasonable, uh, reasonably looking uh, tropical convection and other stuff. So this new class of global models really is simulating the atmosphere uh, uh, more closely to the real thing than uh, we've been ever able uh, to do before. But one of the questions that really uh, we haven't really answered is, uh, how far into the future can we predict weather? And weather here, I mean more general, not just your day-to-day -day weather, but also a seasonal to sub-seasonal or um, uh, even a longer time scale of the whole climate system. So how far into the future can we really predict uh, the atmosphere of the whole Earth system? And uh, well, that's a question that's been really, uh, with us for a long time. And I want to give a brief historical uh, perspective into this, because if we go back a few decades in time, uh, that was at the uh, advent of numerical weather prediction. Uh, the first computers came along, and it was in the 1950s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. It, it was a really optimistic time in terms of what technology could achieve. They were thinking we'd be driving uh, nuclear power cars by today. Um, and they were wrong in, in some other ways, too, about what they, uh, what they thought we can do with the weather uh, prediction. So because very early on, when the first computers came along and they ran the first uh, uh, weather or climate models, they thought, well, the, the, our atmosphere is a deterministic system. Uh, and a deterministic system really means that the present determines the future. But we all know we, we don't know the present perfectly. But they thought, well, if we approximately know the present, we, we can approximately, or the approximate present approximately determines the future. So that was uh, the mind, mindset of uh, uh, most of the scientists in those days. And so they thought, oh, our computers get better, our initial conditions get better. In the end, forecasting the weather is like forecasting the position of the planets. And um, I show this uh, with this graphic here in the lower left where we have a, a hypothetical uh, forecast in blue, let's, call, let's say that's the temperature in Boulder and the observation in black. And you see, that's what they thought uh, we could do. So well, we start out maybe slightly off, but in the grand scheme of things, the forecast trajectory or the observ observation will not deviate too much from the forecast. 
Well, now we know that's not really true because <clears throat> the atmosphere is a chaotic system. So what does it mean? Well, it means um, we're still thinking of a deterministic system, but once we involve chaos, the approximate present does not approximately determine the future anymore. Something goes off, something goes haywire. And even a deterministic system appears like a, like a really random system. And uh, on the right there, you see the Lorenz butterfly that, that is the, the, the poster child of a chaotic system there. And on the left there, there are two time series again. That's what we see in a chaotic system where we have a forecast in blue and uh, an observation uh, taken after the fact in black. And we see early on they're quite close, but then some at some point they're completely off. So um, in the latter part of this time series, there is no agreement between the two curves anymore. And um, well, people, or at least Lorenz, uh, Ed Lorenz, he discovered the whole uh, chaotic uh, system here. He um, was probably one of the most influential atmospheric scientists that ever lived. And nowadays, there is a scientific consensus that the atmosphere is a chaotic system with limited predictability. Um, and we're still really trying to figure out what are the limits of predictability. There, it's, it's a little bit controversial. Um, we haven't really found the limits of predictability yet, and it's still an active area of research. Um, so for the remainder of this talk, uh, I want to talk about predictability and error growth, and I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with these concepts, so let's step through them. Um, let's assume we have a forecast here in blue, and we have observations that could be real observations, but it could also be um, fake observations in, in the sense of a control weather or climate simulation. <clears throat> and these are different, um, especially later on in the forecast or simulation. And the difference between the two, that's what we call the error. So the error is a measure of how good the forecast really is. And uh, in the uh, um, bottom panel here, what you see is when we average over many instances of, of uh, forecasts and observations or many ensemble members or many instances of, of um, grid points, we get a relatively smooth curve, and that is here a time series of the error. So you see, if you compare the lower and the uh, upper panels, it be becomes pretty obvious what's really shown here, that the error is a measure of, uh, of uh, forecast quality, really. Uh, well, so the error is very important in uh, predictability studies. Uh, because the error really determines when the predictability limit is reached. And in, uh, in theory, it tells us that that's when the error saturates. So in this graphic here, in the bottom, you see around day, uh, let's call this days, it's um, non-dimensional time, but at around time 16, 16 days, the error flattens out. So in this case, the error has saturated. And we would say, OK, at time 16 here, that's when we uh, have reached the limit of predictability. Uh, uh, theory tells us there's also another way to determine the, uh, the um, saturation limit, as we call it, because it just happens to be twice the climatological variance. So that's really neat because often our error curves that I show later aren't as nice as this one here in the example, but we can still compute the saturation limit uh, from the climatological variance. So this is the whole concept. We have a saturation limit. We compute the error based on forecasts and observations or forecasts and control simulations. And we just measure it in time and we'll see at what time do, uh, does the predictability or the error curve uh, reach the, the saturation limit. And that's how we determine the limit of predictability. So during my postdoc, I actually set out to do this, um, this, this fairly easy concept uh, with a, a numerical model here at MPAS, uh, here at NCAR, it's called MPAS. And I thought, well, we really want to see um, the limit of predictability using a high resolution simulation. So um, a convection permitting global simulations. Um, and at that time, it was still relatively new, but it's becoming more mainstream now. And so I set out and did this identical twin experiment. So 
We take a control simulation, which we say, this is reality, it's fake reality, but it's a control simulation and run it for 20 days for the time period you need to see indicated there. And then we use the same model, the same initial condition, but just sprinkle a little bit of initial noise into the initial condition. And what I mean by that is uh, take the exact same initial condition, take the exact same model, but to the temperature field of the initial condition, we add some random stochastic noise that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0.0 to Kelvin. So this is immeasurable. If you think about, could we, could we practically determine a difference between these two simulations by um, thinking reality taking a thermometer? No, we could not because our errors are larger than 0.02 when we go out and measure the temperature. So for all intents and purposes, we cannot tell a difference between these two uh, simulations. And as you will likely guess, uh, in the end, they will end up being very uh, different. That's just really the proverbial uh, butterfly effect there. We're adding little butterflies to the initial conditions, and then we're running the perturbed simulation uh, forward. Now, we're not doing this for a whole ensemble, which we probably should to get robust results, but it's just very expensive to run these high resolution uh, global simulations. And then uh, how do we measure predictability? Well, I explained before, we measure the error and just look at the error evolution in time. And the error metric here is the difference kinetic energy. It's just the square difference of the uh, zonal and meridional wind components. Just a few words about the model. It's called MPAS, Model for Prediction Across Scales. It's similar to WORF, but it's on an unstructured mesh. It's global, and you can uh, really use any resolution you'd like. This has a global uniform resolution of four kilometers. And I, I'm here in the graphic, uh, I just plotted the topography field so you can see how detailed this really is. Um, you can see all the details in Colorado. You can almost uh, see your own house in here if you zoom in. Uh, uh, if you zoom in more, but it's really one of the most detailed uh, global simulations that have been used uh, for this kind of purpose. Um, they were initialized with ECMWF high resolution. Uh, no, they were actually initialized with error interim data. Uh, so init uh, initial conditions come from a lower resolution source, and that's why we have a spin up of 24 hours before we start our experiment. Anyway, so in the end, what we get is when we look at a time series of the error, we get this curve uh, starting out at, at zero, which is um, or close to zero, which is just the initial condition noise there. And then as we run it forward and, and measure the difference between these two simulations, we see that the error uh, keeps slowly creeping up until a time of about six, seven days, and then it starts increasing. So this is an exponential system here. Uh, until about two weeks and then uh, some uh, nonlinear effects kick in and the, the error curve approaches the saturation limit at about 16, 17 days. So this is just one real realization. So we shouldn't read too much into it, but what this tells us the global atmosphere has an intrinsic limit of predictability. That's about, uh, I always like to say, two to three weeks. Um, this is, as, as I said before, this is one realization where the predictability limit is more or less exactly 17 days, but a different initial condition and uh, different um, um, or more ensemble members would probably give you a smoother curve here. Anyways, if, if we think about what this graph really tells us, there's some profound, really interesting uh, things here. Um, I always like to say that running these simulations, uh, each simulation costs about $20,000 in uh, compute time. If you convert compute time into money, it's about $20,000. And so you're running a forecast that costs $20,000. And after 17 days, your error is as large as if you had just stupidly looked at climatology and picked a random, random day and used that for a forecast. So it's amazing how, how, how chaos really destroys the breakability in the atmosphere, if you think about it that way. Um, but later on, I will come to, to a few points where, where uh, there's still hope. So don't be too pessimistic about this. 
but what this figure tells us really is there is a, a limit to the predictability of the globally average, this is globally average atmosphere of about two to three weeks. And most people do these studies with globally average data. And I thought, well, that's not really fair because our atmosphere is very uh, distinct, right? In the tropics, we have very different dynamics compared to the middle latitudes um, and the polar regions um, highlighted here in this, uh, on this globe. So I was thinking, well, we should probably look at atmospheric predictability in different climate zones and not just the global average. Um, and so that's what I did with the same data. Uh, in, instead of computing the uh, globally averaged error uh, um, evolution, um, we did it for the climate zones. Um, and this is what we'll get. So again, to uh, refresh what you've seen before, this is the global average, a little faint here in red. And uh, let's look at the polar regions and the middle latitudes. Uh, well, they look fairly similar to the global average. They're a little bit noisier, probably because we're averaging over a smaller area. But in general, they, they trace the, what we saw in the global average. Um, I wasn't too uh, surprised in that um, because uh, we know that the, the predictability limit for middle latitude weather is about 10 to 14 days, maybe a little bit longer, depending on who um, you ask. But then the interesting thing was when I looked at the tropics and uh, let me move this away. So when we look at the error in the tropics, uh, at least after 10 days, it's actually much smaller than in the extra tropics. And this was a little bit, um, uh, I, I was surprised by this because coming from the weather side, I was always, um, or we usually have the impression that middle latitude weather is, is easier to forecast, has longer predictability than tropical weather. And this graphic tells us, well, uh, actually in the tropics, you have better predictability. You pre remember the predictability limit is when uh, the error curve hits the saturation limit. The saturation limit is highlighted here in the black dash curve. And at 20 days, that's how long these uh, experiments were. In the tropics, we're, we, we're not there yet. So that formally tells us that the predictability of the tropics is longer than 20 days, uh, much longer than the mid latitudes, which is only two weeks, three weeks. Um, so that was a, a, a new interesting finding. Um, and so the question is, why is this? This is counterintuitive to what we in the weather community have been thinking for a long time. And uh, it turns out, uh, I think it has to do um, with equatorial waves. And I'm going to explain this here in short. So equatorial waves are these weather phenomena that live in the tropics, that propagate along the equator, uh, bring alternating periods of, of rain and dry weather. And they come in different flavors. There are Calvin waves here on the upper left, uh, Rossby waves, mixed Rossby gravity waves. There are also inertial gravity waves. So different kinds of equatorial waves. Um, and so I, I set out to look at the, to see if this uh, extended predictability in the tropics has to do with equatorial waves. So first we'll define equatorial waves in the model data. And uh, this shows uh, essentially how we do that. In the uh, background here, that's a half Miller plot. Uh, so a time longitude, anything that's tilted on here, uh, in the in the filled colors is propagating signals and you can filter them with the wave filter and then you get the components. Uh, so these are in the in the contours here. That's for uh, Rossby waves. Um, it will enhance this. Uh, it's stuck at the moment. Well, it, here it is. Um, this is for Calvin waves. And then we can do the same thing for mid-journal waves. I'm going to do it quickly now. So we see there's propagating signals all in uh, all over this model in the tropical regions. And now uh, what I looked at was the error of the waves themselves. So what we're seeing here on the left in the control simulation, that's our fake reality. We have the wind magnitude of Kelvin waves um, and also plotted in, in a half mill diagram. So we see, uh, actually these are Rossby waves, I think. Yeah, they're going westward. These are Rossby waves. And then we do the same for the perturbed simulation. And 
if you have uh, limited predictability at some point you will you would think they these signals are completely scrambled but looking at these two figures they actually look very similar throughout the whole 20 days and uh, that's actually the case because when you look at the error oops i went too far um, on the right here, that's the error. So that's the difference between the two fields. And it's fairly faint throughout the ten, first 10 days. Later on, there's some error, but the magnitude of the error is still less than uh, the weight and magnitude in the two simulations. So that's a sign there is predictability because the error is not as large as the signal itself. And we can do it for Kelvin waves, same thing. So. These, the control and perturb simulation look very similar and the error is small. If I were looking at, um, at mid-latitude phenomena, you would see a much larger area here. And then this is for mixed Rossby Bradley waves and again. So control and perturb simulation are similar throughout almost 20 days, even though uh, chaos uh, is supposed to be there. But for some reason in the tropics, the tropics behave differently than we thought. There is I don't know if it's linear wave theory, but if we again look at the um, error evolution in the tropics, and then we overlay the error curves from the respective waves, they actually kind of match what we saw. We just take square differences of the wind field. So that's my hand wavy argument that predictability in the tropics comes from equatorial waves. And the question is, well, why are forecasts in the tropics so bad, right? So right now, we do much worse in the tropics than in the mid-latitudes. And this shows you what, what I mean by that. On the left, that's a hot mode diagram of observed precipitation. We see nicely propagating bands of precip. And in the middle on the right, that's the GFS and the uh, IFS model. And they just don't produce waves. It's just the, the precipitation is anchored to certain longitudes but it doesn't really look anything like the left, the observed precipitation. And I think what really is the matter here is uh, cumulus parameterization. So in MPAS, um, in MPAS, we have observations here on the left. Uh, this is from a study that just came out in GRL. And I'm gonna step through quickly. We ran MPAS with different resolutions. That's at 480 kilometers, so really coarse, uh, doesn't get the propagating waves. 240 kilometers, does, still doesn't get them. 120 kilometers, that's about what nowadays climate models can do. Um, barely get the propagating signal. 60 kilometers, still not. Even 30 kilometers, there's a, there are hints of propagating signals. 15 kilometers, maybe a little better, but still you see the precipitation is really stationary. Now things change when we go to seven and a half kilometers. That's when the cumulus parameterization turns off. And suddenly you get these propagating wave packets and they even come, become better at 3.75 kilometers. So I think this graphic nicely shows what's, what's wrong with our current models is parameter, parameterized convection. So for some reason, we're not getting the, the propagating waves if we run the model with parameterized convection, as soon as we get to a high enough resolution and the parameterized convection shuts down, convection is explicitly resolved, we get much better representation of equatorial waves. And that means we could now harvest or exploit this predictability in making better forecasts. And that's really um, all I had. So I was looking at the predictability of weather, but this is really uh, more general. We can also call it weather or um, 20 days. That's already getting to the uh, sub-seasonal time scales. Um, and in the tropic, it looks like that the predictability limit is longer. So uh, at least 20 days, actually we don't know it because the simulations were only 20 days long. Um, who knows if it's 30, 40, 50 days of, of predictability in the tropics. Um, in the extra tropics, it's really maybe two weeks, maybe up to three weeks. And the extended predictability in the tropics seems to be related to equatorial waves. Uh, and we cannot exploit it yet because our models are really poor at simulating equatorial waves. So we need global models with explicit convection that produce nice equatorial waves. And then we can exploit the predictability and actually produce better forecasts in the tropics, um, in theory, better than in the middle latitudes. Um, yeah, so that's all I had, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, 
Thanks for the talk. Um, it was really different from what we heard, but super interesting. Um, Yanak has a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I learned many, many things. So I have a question like, uh, in the model error curve, that seems like it's always increasing monotony. Could it be possible like it might sort of sometimes increase, other times decrease? I think so, yeah. Um, I think so. I think this is just uh, one realization. So it, it's not really robust. Uh, I think uh, when you run more simulations or full ensembles, you would see where it's sometimes increasing and sometimes decreasing. Yeah, so in that case, like how to determine the predictability, like how to make comments. Again, oh. it might depend on the variable chosen. Yeah, so in that, it true, it depends on the variables. And I was specifically showing wind variables here. Um, I, I am going to look at moisture variables. Um, and you may get a different answer uh, if you look at moisture versus wind. But you would, in, in that case, or, or going back to the um, uh, robustness. So if you have an ensemble, you would just average over. And I, I would think in the end, you would also get a relatively smooth curve. Uh, and I suspect it, it will be the same for other variables, but I, I am going to look at uh, moisture variables because in the tropics, they may be a little bit more useful than uh, the wind variables. Thank you. Um, Sam had a question. Oh, hi. Yeah, just I really like your uh, definition of uh, predictability. It's a really nice quantified way uh, to define it. Uh, is, there, is there any statistical theory, uh, theoretical base for the definition of two climatological variants? Yeah, so that there is a, a, a theory behind it. Um, but if you're asking me about, about it now, I don't remember. I, I knew it, I think, when I did my PhD, but I had forgotten. Um, it, it comes out of ensemble theory. So it comes out of ensemble theory and uh, it, it's definitely, um, yeah, it's weird that it works out that way, that the climatological variance is just twice the, uh, or the, the saturation limit is twice the uh, climatological variance, but it does come out of, um, of, uh, of a nice theory. I think it's a literature in a paper by uh, Lloyd Becker and Palmer 2007. That's not the original reference, but the original yeah. reference is in there. Okay. Oh, thanks, you. <laughs> you probably know more about that than me. <laughs> well, uh, I, I found it puzzling every single time. Um, uh, and then you do it, and then it becomes clear. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hi, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, OK, uh, it's a nice talk. Uh, thanks. Uh, could you go back to the uh, diagrams that, uh, compare, that, that shows the uh, error increase for tropics? And, uh, yeah. Um, hold on, I'm going to bring up the slide and then I'll share my screen. The, the saturation, the, 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 uh, the line for saturation is, uh, it's, uh, uh, you, you calculate it separately for the tropics and for the globe? Yes. Uh, so, so um, hold on a second. Are you uh, talking about this figure? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. The okay. saturation limit uh, yeah. is that the same for the uh, for the tropics? No, it's not. So it's not the same. Um, that's why I normalized it. So it's it's in percent right. because if you okay. use the absolute values, it would be they would be all different. So to compare them, I just normalized by the saturation limit. So it, it what you see here is just the error saturation in percent, not just uh, not the error magnitude. Okay. Also, I also noticed that at the beginning, in the first five days, the tropics, the area yeah. increased much faster. Yes. Yes. So, um, that's, so that, a good, yeah. that's a good observation. I think that's where the where the convection comes into play. So during the first couple of days, the area does grow faster in the tropics, probably because you have a lot more convection there. Uh, yeah, probably the, uh, the, 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 that's the, the, the um, model parameterization is, is not the best. Uh, and also, uh, do you think in the tropics that the error grows slower? That's uh, also uh, caused by the, the uh, more persistence in the tropics. Yeah, and I should probably note here at this point, this is all done with an uncoupled model. So the SSTs are prescribed and they're the same in, in the simulation. So 
you could make an argument that the uh, that the tropical predictability here is artificially long because I use the same pre-stripe SSD and it's not a coupled model. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anish had a question. Yeah, I think it's related to the discussion about the initial error growth from convection Falco. So Tobias Schultz and George Craig, I think they had this work mm -hmm. where they had done um, regional but convective resolving simulations over Europe and looked at error growth time scales, right? And mm -hmm. what they showed was like in the first six hours, you have this convective error growth, which is a rapid error growth. And mm -hmm. then you get the synoptic um, error growth, which is slower, but it uh, still leads to towards the saturation limit. And then you have error growth on the mesoscale and larger scales. But the question is, as we go into convective resolving global models, will this become a bigger problem for us that if we get the convective initiation wrong, then the initial error growth can rapidly get the models away from where we want to be from the balanced um, attractor space. I, and yeah, I think I think you're right, but I think you're it's it's still there's still added value over running coarser uh, simulations with a cumulus parameterization because, for example, you don't get any, any good equatorial waves. So yeah, uh, there are phenomena that you simply don't get when you have uh, parameters convection. That's kind of separate from the error growth issue. So I think there there are two separate. I think yeah, for error growth itself, you're right. Um, and Tobias has, has shown that it doesn't really matter if you have the cumulus parameterization or explicit convection. It's just the error grows very fast early on. Um, but then, uh, at least with a with a explicit convection, you do get other phenomena that are more realistic than in the model with parameterized convection. Yeah. And and so sadly, we don't have long enough simulation yet to look at really MGOs uh, in a statistical sense. But my hunch, my guess is that we actually do get better MGOs when because I mean, uh, equatorial waves are kind of related to MGOs; they're all in there. So. Um, so I think we're now producing our current models, MGOs, but they're not really realistic because they, we don't have any equatorial waves in that. Yeah. 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 yeah, we can have a longer conversation. My question was in terms of stochastic modeling and should we yeah. rethink stochastic modeling if the error growth um, has a different nature when we resolve? Yeah, I, so I think error growth, no, but I think, again, you're using a coarser resolution model with stochastic noise, I doubt you'll get equatorial waves that are realistic. So just from a from an error growth perspective, you can simulate convection or you can simulate error with stochastic methods, but not sure if it would translate to getting coherent features that um, explicit convection produces, but maybe it does. I'm tempted to say sometimes you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question before Jacqueline, um, and this is, um, I, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on the classical predictability has all been done in terms of saturation spectra and mm -hmm. spherical harmonics, and um, you differentiated this with looking at the different um, uh, latitudinal bands, but then when we talk about S2S predictability, it is all MJ mm -hmm. related to state dependence like MJO mm -hmm. and um, and so etc. NAO and so um, you you clearly touched on the base by looking at these spectra, but I was wondering if you could reconcile the state dependent view with sort of the homogeneous turbulence view in terms of predictability, mm -hmm. and also if you could comment in this context on state dependence. So would those spectra look the same if you pick another 20, 30 day period where the MJO might be in another region? So I, I think they would look different. The, I, so first of all, to reconcile these two views, I've been wrestling with that for years. I still haven't found, I think they're just two sides of a coin that they measure more or they want to measure the similar things, but they don't. So I think this, the spectra uh, are 
are not really useful for MGL, looking at MGL predictability and stuff. Uh, so uh, the state dependence, yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. I think it's very important. So I think the, these error growth curves would probably look different when I use a different initial time. And uh, you could probably get periods where you have low error growth and you use a different initial condition, you suddenly get a, a, a faster error growth. Um, but yeah, we haven't tested that because simply computers, uh, computing power. But yeah, it's a, so I think, and I don't know how to essentially know that beforehand, which, which, which initial setup could give you longer predictability where it can actually make weather forecasts for maybe a month. It's possible, right? And, and, MGOs or and, and so MGO are in a very predictable state. Suddenly, you can make weather forecasts that are three, four weeks. Um, but I think it, it just there has to be there needs to be research done to really look into that uh, and maybe to reconcile the spectral view. I I'm I really think the spectral view should it we're in the past <laughs> or it, it worked well in the past. It doesn't really work well for uh, kind of our modern models or modern science questions anymore. Yeah, yeah it works for homogeneous turbulence. No, it may, yeah. We should talk more. This is a very interesting topic to me. Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline, you have the last, last question. Hello, thank you so much. That was a really good talk. Thank I was you. wondering, uh, so you didn't mention explicitly uh, that your simulation was coupled to an oceanic model. So I'm assuming MBAS is just an atmospheric, atmospheric yeah. model. Yes. So I was wondering, given that the tropics is an atmosphere ocean coupled system, mm -hmm. I I <laughs> I'm I'm suspecting that like the air sea fluxes are like part of your errors, you know? Yeah. So I was just wondering, do you think if you couple, I know it's expensive, but just thinking mm -hmm. about it. Like if you can couple that atmospheric model to an oceanic model, will you get better predictability? Will it be worse? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanna- Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, well, thanks for that question. I get the, that question every time I talk about this topic. And the question is, I don't know. So my guess is that you, it's kind of, well, you can make arguments that uh, if you have a, a, this couple to an ocean, so the errors can maybe amplify, so your errors grow faster, but you can also make the argument that maybe the ocean drives the atmosphere more. So if you have um, an interactive ocean that uh, the atmosphere follows the ocean um, and maybe gives it longer predictability. Uh, I think it's very case dependent. And in, in the grand scheme of things, I would hope that a couple uh, model would give you lower error or longer predictability. And finally, this year we're supposed to have a coupled MPAS model uh, through the through CESM essentially. So I think at the end of the year we can actually look at that. We're we're planning to run simulations that are coupled. So after years, finally MPAS will be a coupled model later this year. Also, oh, really good noise. At one degree, Thank right? you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're going to test high resolution too. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for this um, inspiring talk, Falco. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Sergei Frolov. Um, he, uh, uh, Frolov, he also gave a talk last week. So, thank you so much. Um, uh, Sergei uh, used to work um, at NRL um, on couple data assimilation. And um, uh, a while ago joined um, uh, NOAA and is now uh, focusing on the development of the coupled reanalysis using uh, UFS. Uh, Sergey, we're looking forward to your talk. I think Sergey is there, but I saw him get a call and he stepped away. Okay. Sure. So Hemi had a question for Falco on the chat, maybe. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize, Hemi, I did not see it. That's fine, uh, thank you. Um, 
Thanks for the nice talk. And uh, my question is about the uh, um, cumulus parameterization. So do you think there is a way to improve the equatorial waves uh, with parameterization instead of increasing resolution? Um, I'm skeptical because very smart people have worked on cumulus parameterization for decades. And for some reason we haven't gotten good enough to produce equatorial waves. Uh, so I think in I th my personal opinion is um, just doing the brute force method, um, just essentially being intellectually lazy and just run higher resolution models is better than thinking about how to improve the parameterizations. Um, it that's purely for forecasting. If you want to understand the system, I think um, thinking about it and maybe building better parameterizations is possible. But for the for for like if we want to have better forecasts within the next five years, I think the way is just to go to a convection permitting simulations. And as far as I know, ECMWF is going to go that way. Uh, the UK Met Office is. So we're already in the in in on route to running global models without cumulus parameterization in many centers. Thank you.